Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, my discussion is going to be a reflection on the following question. Do we need a government to run a good financial system? And it will allow me to discuss some of the ideas of uh, the Doug Diamond and Kiyotaki and Moore and other related ideas. So the government is deeply embedded in the process of financial intermediation. And the government banking nexus is traditionally organized around the, the following four pillars. You have loans and securities, you have deposits, you have deposit insurance and lender of last resort, and you have prudential supervision and uh, regulation. So to some extent, you can think of uh, financial intermediation as a joint production process uh, uh, through a public-private partnership uh, of sorts. And the question is whether uh, that's a feature uh, or a bug. And I will argue that it's a bit of both. But to attack this question, I want to use a methodology that doesn't presume the answer. So uh, I'll use a normative mechanism design approach to the financial system in words. And uh, the idea is going to be to uh, identify the key frictions and market failures that lead to government interventions. I'll argue that it's a perspective that has far-ranging implications in a very different context. And I'll give a few examples. Uh, the destabilizing effects of shadow banking, the architecture of the international monetary systems, and uh, doom loops between banks and sovereigns and the design of uh, banking unions. I'll use uh, uh, an organizing framework that I've developed with uh, Jean Tirole in a recent paper, and I'll branch out from there to discuss other ideas uh, by myself, by others, uh, and by Doug and Kiyotaki and more. But uh, first I want to emphasize uh, the get-go, the deep connections uh, uh, between um, what I'm going to do and uh, what uh, uh, Doug and, uh, and Kiyotaki and Moore uh, are doing. There's a first level of connection, which is the approach. Okay, so it's an insistence on micro foundations, uh, on mechanism design. The second is uh, some very important ideas. Uh, the, the, the perception of banks as uh, delegated monitors and securities holders that are also deposit takers with agency problems. That's something that can be uh, seen very well in, uh, in Doug's work. The idea that deposit insurance uh, can be used to prevent runs uh, in Diamond Divvig. And the interaction between inside and outside money uh, that's present uh, in Kiyotaki and more. So I'll introduce the, the frictions and the market failures uh, as I proceed, and then I'll emphasize the interactions between them uh, when they arise. So as uh, uh, Nobu uh, showed you uh, in his papers, in environments where you have limited pledgeability and incomplete markets and aggregate risk, you can have shortages of uh, inside liquidity. Okay, and the government because it has a unique ability to, uh, to tax, can sort of remedy uh, these shortages of inside liquidity by providing outside liquidity. So let me take an example from a different context that you'll all be familiar with. Think about intergenerational risk sharing. It's very difficult, almost impossible, for uh, present and future generations to share risk together because future generations cannot participate in financial markets to ensure the risk that would materialize uh, in the meantime. But the government can tax future generations uh, in a state contingent way and provide transfer to uh, operate uh, this uh, risk sharing. Okay? So the government can sort of overcome these, uh, these uh, uh, shortages problems uh, by mobilizing its fiscal capacity. But of course, this fiscal capacity is costly. So you only want to deploy it uh, when you really have to. And uh, uh, the, the, the cases where this liquidity is the most lacking is in very bad states of the world, where you have very few assets that you can uh, rely on for sure. And the government really has an advantage in providing insurance in a state contingent way in those, uh, in those instances. And you can think of lender of last resort and uh, deposit insurance as being justified by, uh, by these shortages. It's very different from ex post bailout. It's really some kind of ex ante priced uh, insurance against ex post uh, tail risk. So uh, think about Diamond Divic, for example. One of the ways in which sprite markets could try to prevent runs was by securing credit lines. But they would need to be able to acquire this liquidity in private markets. And it's difficult to think that this liquidity would be available in case of systemic crisis. So instead, it's better to rely on, on that kind of insurance from the government. It's different from ex post bailout because it's something that can be done with commitment. Okay? It doesn't rely uh, necessarily on the government stepping in to validate the errors of, uh, of the financial system. 
But of course, once you accept uh, that there's going to be land of last resort and deposit insurance, that gives rise to uh, very important complementarities that are going to justify other forms of government intervention. Uh, uh, and these uh, complementarities are going to arise through fiscal externalities that are generated by moral hazard. Uh, so if you provide land of last resort, you don't want banks to exploit uh, this insurance exposed by taking too much risk uh, ex ante. And so you want to engage in supervision and regulation if you're going to provide land of last resort. Same thing uh, with deposit insurance. Okay. So you see that you want to supervise and you want to regulate and that you have economies of scale, uh, economies of scope in regulation because this between these different forms of, uh, of uh, government intervention. There are other very important rationales for uh, supervision and regulation. Some of them are non-systemic, like the protection and the representation of consumers that might have a hard time monitoring the banks. The others are uh, systemic and there's a growing realization that these sort of systemic reasons for regulation are, are very important. So you have uh, pecuniary externalities, uh, think about fire sales. You have aggregate demand externalities, think of uh, Keynesian effects. And, uh, and these externalities are really macroeconomic externalities. Okay? They arise when the whole system gets in trouble, when the whole system does something wrong. And there's a, a paper that I wrote with uh, Ivan Werning that sort of uh, uh, proposes a unified theory uh, of these interventions and of these externalities. Now let's try to think about shadow banking. So as you probably know, there's been a huge rise of uh, the shadow banking system, which is essentially banking but outside of uh, the traditional parameter uh, of uh, traditional banking where the government is so involved. Uh, and uh, and uh, there's been a lot of migration of activities that used to take place in the traditional regulated financial system to the shadow banking sector. So it's a system uh, where you don't have any lender or last resort, you don't have any deposit insurance, and you don't have any supervision or regulation. Okay, and uh, that's going to lead to uh, to the big problem there. Uh, one of the big problems is that even though the government is not involved contractually or uh, the, uh, de jure in uh, this financial system, it's involved, it's involved de facto because uh, when uh, troubles arise in the shadow banking system, the government is sort of called to the rescue. And we've seen like lots of bailouts and guarantees that were extended exposed to parts of the, the shadow banking system. And uh, the, one of the worries is that these, uh, these interventions are sort of factored in ex ante and can lead to uh, ex ante moral hazard. Okay, so that's uh, really more of a bug than a feature, uh, the involvement uh, of, uh, of the government in this case. Now, there are many interrelations between the banking sector and the shadow banking sector. Okay? The first one is that you have the option to migrate some activities from the traditional banking sector to the shadow banking sector. Others uh, take place uh, uh, through the form of liquidity and risk sharing and provision between these two sectors. So think about banks, for example, extending uh, uh, you know, top-ups and uh, liquidity insurance and credit lines to uh, special purpose vehicles and off-balance sheet uh, uh, things. Uh, think also about the formal banking system obtaining insurance from uh, uh, entities that are in the shadow banking center, like, like AIG, for example, that was uh, providing credit default swaps. And uh, there's uh, something else that creates a link between these two sectors, which uh, happens exposed. So the, the shadow banking system, in, uh, to some extent, uh, uses a very different strategy than a traditional banking system to back uh, uh, safe and liquid deposits. Uh, and it's by purchasing uh, liquid assets uh, and, uh, and selling them to regulated banks in case uh, of a run. Okay? So that's a theory that's been put forth uh, in a recent paper. And, and, and it tells you, it's a theory that tells you that you will see the shadow banking sector expanding in booms and sort of contracting in busts with repatriation of assets to uh, the traditional uh, banking sector. Okay, so you have this instability through deposits in the shadow banking sector. In the traditional banking sector, deposits are very stable because they're insured. And uh, the shadow banking sector has a lot of destabilizing effects. Okay? The first one is that you have the option to migrate, so that creates a participation or an incentive constraint, and uh, 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 that's something that's going to lead uh, to rents in the traditional uh, banking sector. The other is that you're going to have like, a lot of the, 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 the 
the protections that the government is trying to impose through regulation are going to be undone by the shadow banking sector. Uh, you can have the siphoning of liquidity the, uh, uh, and the granting of bogus liquidity uh, and credit lines from the shadow banking sector. And so one of the ways in which uh, 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 it might be helpful to deal with that is through structural remedies. So think about ring fencing between the traditional and the shadow banking sector and the introduction of central clearing uh, counterparties. The shadow banking sector is also creating the, uh, the possibility of runs of pecuniary and aggregate demand externalities. It's really something that's happening outside of the traditional system. It's also creating fiscal externalities through these bailouts. And there's a sense in which there's something very systemic going on. Like the, the more activities are migrating to the shadow banking sector, the more the government has to intervene if uh, something goes wrong uh, exposed. And that's also something that can destabilize the traditional uh, banking sector, actually. Uh, so one the question is what to do with that. So it's tempting to say that we should uh, extend the traditional domain of regulation to the shadow banking sector. But the question is exactly how to do that and how to do that without uh, killing the benefits that come with the shadow banking sector in terms of competition, innovation, and the provision of a yardstick for, uh, for the traditional banking sector. Uh, the final thing I want to discuss is uh, 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 an analogy. Okay? Uh, and it's an analogy uh, of financial intermediation in the realm of uh, international macroeconomics. So there's a view that uh, 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 you can think of reserve countries, governments, as bankers supplying safe assets uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, you have very few uh, large issuers uh, in this business, and you have situations typically of monopoly or uh, duopoly. So think about the U.S., the, the situation today as being a situation of uh, uh, quasi-monopoly with the U.S. Uh, uh, having a dominant position. And uh, you've had situations of duopoly uh, in the past, like the U.S. and the U.K. in the 20s, or you could think about the U.S. and China maybe uh, in the future. And so I, I have a, a recent paper where I try to uh, sort of flesh out this analogy by uh, proposing a model of the international monetary system that combines financial intermediation theory, uh, industrial organization and perfect competition, and uh, international macro. And to, to understand the, the, the connection, it's useful to go back to uh, the Bretton Woods era and this thing called the Triffin Dilemma. So this was in the 60s, and there was this growing demand for reserve assets, and only one country essentially in a position to supply uh, these reserve assets, uh, the US. And at the time, there were two opposing views. Triffin thought that uh, this would create a dilemma where the US would either have to accommodate this growing demand for reserve assets, but then it would have to, to extend itself and, and uh, risk exposing itself to, uh, to a, a confidence crisis. Uh, and the, the, there was a, an opposing view by Depre, Kindleberger, and Sarney. It was called the World Banker view, which said, well, look, there's nothing unnatural or unstable about this situation. You can think of the U.S. as a world banker supplying safe assets uh, to the, world, the rest of the world. Now, of course, uh, the world uh, sort of proved Triffin right. There was an end to the Bretton Woods system through a run on the dollar. And one way to think about it is world banking is fragile. Okay? You can have self-fulfilling runs, shifts uh, from monetary to fiscal dominance, devaluations, and, uh, and loss of reputation. And one of the contributions of the paper is to show that uh, this is not something that's predicated on the Bretton Woods system, on fixed exchange rates and very uh, small private capital flows. It also exists with flexible exchange rate and large capital flows because uh, uh, safe currencies embed the promise uh, for good performance in times of crisis. And if you violate that promise, then you might lose uh, your status. So this analogy, and I'll, I'll wrap up with that, uh, is very profound. And you can think about these uh, countries as banks, but the problem is that there's no meta-government to sort of deal with them, okay? So world banking is fragile. We have this new Triffin dilemma, but there's no land of last resort or deposit insurance uh, uh, for these reserve issuers, okay? So we have to live with this fragility. Uh, if you have a, a shortage of liquidity, a shortage of safe assets, then you're going to have to live with a high liquidity and risk premium, low interest rates. You could hit the zero lower bound. There's no outside liquidity that could be supplemented. If you have a monopolist uh, world banker then, uh, uh, like with, with that, that has power, he might overissue, uh, uh, actually, and, uh, and risk a crisis because he doesn't internalize uh, the consequences of his decision on consumer surplus if uh, trust uh, unravels. Uh, there are very uh, uh, interesting parallels also between the effects of competition in traditional banking and uh, for the international monetary system. Okay? If you have competition, it can exacerbate coordination problem uh, among creditors and lead to more instability as, cre as uh, creditors move from one currency and into the, the other. That's a point that was made by Nurks uh, 
in the 40s. And you also have a loss of discipline that arises uh, uh, through the erosion of franchise value. Okay, you have more competition, uh, you have less to lose uh, if you blow up, and that can uh, relax uh, incentives. And that's very useful to try to think about what could be the future of the international monetary system if uh, competition from new currencies are going to create a lot of benefits or on the contrary, if there are going to be uh, instabilities. It's also helpful to think about uh, the design of the international monetary system. One thing that could be done, even though we can provide more liquidity, is to try to share this liquidity uh, efficiently. And so to think about international risk sharing and lend or last resort uh, between uh, safe asset uh, demanders. So uh, I'll conclude there. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. We have 10 minutes for questions. Please raise your hands. Yes? So, um, so Technology is changing lending. So we've got machine learning now that can download tons of data that predict defaults probably better than relationship lending can. We have online platforms that connect borrowers and lenders, things like the Lending Club, blockchain potentially based currencies but offer new ways to store value. So my question for you is, in a world where the technology of banking is changing, do you see this as just a new implementation of the same fundamental economics underlying it? Or do you think this will change some of the basics of the relationships that you've described? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, unless you sort of think that big data means there's no more privacy of information, I don't think it changes things in, in a major way. I think it could still be the case that uh, two, two things. One that individual lenders or institutions might be able to either process the, the big data better, um, sort of think of like high-frequency traders, or, um, or collect additional information. So I don't think it's going to be the case that we're going to have like a perfectly competitive market where everybody can trade claims on each other. Uh, so I still think this idea of pooling these things and turning them into uh, relatively safe and, and, and liquid assets will be around. So, I mean, in some sense, I know, like, from the experience of, of, like, Lending Club, there's sort of, like, at least initially, there was, like, a high-frequency trader problem there that certain people would pick off the good loans in the first microseconds they were on there. So if you or I went on there two seconds later, uh, we, we really wouldn't be any able to end up trading those things. So I, I don't think the, the, the pooling tranching thing is going to go away, uh, but it's obviously... You know, if you level the playing field and put more public information, private information will have less value. Yes. I, I guess this is this is for Doug. I like the emphasis. I like the emphasis you have. Clearly, lot, there are lots of institutions that issue lots of short-term debt. That almost by definition implies that it's privately efficient. You've tried to make a strong argument that, in fact, it's socially efficient. Uh, certainly, it's socially efficient if it's a threat of a run that's never realized in, uh, along the equilibrium path. I'm wondering, in terms of spillovers to the non-financial sector of the economy, are there ways we could think about designing these contractual ar arrangements so that we retain the disciplinary effect? Off runs without having too much of an effect on the rest of the economy. Let me give you one illustration of what I mean. Uh, one channel whereby stuff spills over to the rest of the economy is through the effect on the payment system. So uh, would it make sense for us to think about divorcing the payment system from these mechanisms to discipline the managers of these kinds of financial enterprises? That's one. Second, which I guess I'm going to talk about tomorrow, is issues about how it affects uh, investment by non-financial kinds of firms. But more generally, can one design these contracts in such a way that say, hey, look, in response to an aggregate shock, in response to a systemic run, we don't do these kinds of things, in response to uh, something idiosyncratic that's intended to discipline the managers, um, we in fact do exercise the run? So, uh, so that's sort of to be split into two questions. One is, suppose you, you, you think that there is essentially a not fully committed government policy to respond to, to um, financial crises of various types. Uh, you know, there is some benefit to treating individual failures from systemic failures, but uh, as we know, like 
uh, you know, Emmanuel has worked on this, Raghu and I have I worked on this, that, that then creates sort of a collective moral hazard problem uh, that, you know, you, you all want it, that the opposite of incentive to diversify, you want to make sure you're all in trouble at the same time. So if, the, if, if you imagine that, you know, runs have a nice, the threat of runs has a nice private discipline effect, but at some times you know that they, it will call sort of, sort of co cause a collective punishment on all of us, including many of the innocent. Uh, there have to be some issues of both ex ante regulation and, you know, some government uh, or, you know, more than unilateral contracting to, to you know, to step in. So then separating the payment system, or not, so in, in some sense it's related to something I said about whether this is just about payments. So in some sense there's a demand for liquid assets or relatively safe assets that's bigger than the payments <laughs> set. Uh, so that if you go, it depends on how you sort of separate uh, the two. So if you separate them too much, like say narrow banking or something like that, then you lose access to the pool of capital for the people who want to hold liquid and relatively safe assets to go into, uh, you know, the capital stock of the uh, of the of the economy. Uh, so that there's, you know, it's like a trade-off. So so I don't have a, a short answer, although I've, you know I, you know, 15 years of thought to to, to tell you that. <laughs> uh, that's the best I got after 15 years. Uh, Rigid. This is a question between Doug uh, and uh, Emmanuel. Uh, in a sense, uh, I, it's about the role of the land of last resort. In a, in a DV model, if I'm not mistaken, the land of last resort uh, fixes all the problems because uh, the, we know what is the value in the future. There is a temporary liquidity, so if the land of last resort intervenes, we solve the problem of the bank runs. In the Diamond Rajan model, this is more complicated because uh, uh, you, as you said, the, the runs are a feature, not a bug. So, uh, how would you run a lender of last resort in a diamond version model? You let uh, the first one to fail, then you intervene in the systemic uh, component. Uh, what is the rule here? So, one thing, preface um, there's once you think the assets are illiquid for a reason rather than just the te technology. Um, then even the lender of last resort itself can be a little problematic because it has to be the case that the, the lender of last resort um, can get a reasonably high recovery on the assets if it ends up with ownership in the case of, the, of some default. So when you, when you think about endogenous assets that are endogenously illiquid, the, the rate at which the lender of last resort is willing to lend isn't the same as the, the hold the maturity value. So there's a there's a second level of illiquidity. So it's a haircut the lender of last resort has to put in. Uh, and then I think the, the idea is that you wouldn't want to lend just that amount. You'd like to lend somewhat more than the, the lender of last resort could recover if it ended up with the collateral. So even if you didn't do anything along the lines of Chari's question about thinking about the systemic crises versus individual crises, the role of the lender of last resort is to allow more short-term debt and more lending of last resort than the recovery they could get, but not the full value. So that's, I think, that's the bet. So there's a, this thing, the pawnbroker of, of last resort in Mervyn King's book. So he has the, basically the idea that there's some level of lender of last resort quantity that you, that lender, that the government should commit to, and that's the most short-term debt that the system should be allowed to have. I think in a dynamic sense, you can do better than that. Okay, our last question by Ricardo. Uh, it's both to Nova, but also partly to Doug. I mean, in a world in which, look, moving forward, a little bit like Laura was trying to do, if I think of a world in the future where the central bank issues digital currency in the sense of it allows everyone to deposit the central bank and at the same time buys long-term assets, the central bank is doing some of this short, long. Do we think that is a complement or as a substitute for the liquidity creation of the private financial intermediaries? So again, it depends on how you implement it. Uh, if you thought essentially that the, like, if you think the reason the deposits are safe is because of deposit insurance, then the natural thing is to have all the deposits go to the central bank, and they would have to allocate a lot of the capital to private businesses. So if you think that's a good solution, um, you know, there's sort of like, there's a free market plus and a free market minus to that. Uh, if you think that's a good solution, that would solve the problem of bank bailouts, and then you just have to hope that the people in the treasury were good at allocating capital across businesses. Uh, if you thought that wasn't the case, then that's not the, the right thing. And then maybe you, you think about taking something about for the payment system. 
So then you'd have to offer a below market interest rate on the on the what what you'd put through the the treasury. That um, I mean, there was like a proposal around. Uh, to allow banks to offer deposits that were collateralized only by deposits at the Federal Reserve in the U.S. So, uh, Jamie McAndrews, who has made this, this, so you could imagine that would be like a free market test of narrow banking that competed with wide banking. That, that actually might be a sensible thing, but you know, if you want, if you required narrow banking, I think that's that's probably a bad idea. Okay, I'm sorry, but it's time to finish. Thanks to all presenters.